Hey guys, welcome to our Instagram Live. It's Sunday afternoon here in Toronto, 1.15 or so. We are gonna be doing an Instagram Live and spe uh, speaking specifically about ventilators and COVID-19. Um, I will be joined by Dr. Dov Weiss. He's our anesthesia doctor, one of the anesthetists that work in our clinic. And I'll have him join us and talk about the ventilator, the machine that's behind me, that will be potentially transferred to our local hospital to help them deal with the oncoming onslaught of potential patients. Right now, things in Toronto are staying case because you never know. Uh, we've taken precautions to minimize uh, the chance of this exploding, but whatever we do does take time. There's a time lag, so actually we take today won't really become effective for the next two to three weeks. So I'm just gonna wait for Dr. Weiss to join us here, and then we'll go from there. All right, we are connecting. Awesome, there we go, Dr. Morpheus. Thanks for joining us. All right, so uh, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, people are popping by, they're waving. Sometimes there may be a question. There may be a question for you or me. So we'll try to answer it. But what I wanted to do is to have you join us and talk about the machine behind me and try to kind of explain what this is all about. It is old, yes, I made it very clear. This is not a state-of-the-art latest machine out there. But it does get things done. We use it for our patients. Uh, typically, we don't ventilate our patients. Patients are asleep, but they breathe on their own. But sometimes when they need to be paralyzed, this machine has to breathe for them. And so it's, it's an actual ventilator. So that we can go ahead and we talk about, uh, in general, in plastic surgery, why do we ventilate patients? So um, first of all, so my name is Dove. Hi, everybody, nice to meet you. Um, my job is, as an anesthesiologist is to make sure the patients are taken care of during their operations. And part of that means that we are act as um, a, uh, as a standby for all of the organs in your body that are normally taking care of you, that are normally functioning when you're nice and awake. During an operation, we give you anesthetic that makes you go to sleep, and we are responsible for supervising those organs and making sure that they're continuing to function properly. And, you know, two of the most important organs in your body are your heart and your lungs, and the ventilator is responsible for making sure that your lungs continue to function and that the tissues in your body continue to receive oxygen. The way that your body normally functions is your diaphragm and your respiratory muscles are responsible for bringing air into your lungs and inflating your lungs and then expunging that air by contracting and moving the air out of your lungs. And it utilizes a process, your body utilizes a process known as creating negative intrathoracic pressure. So there is pressure in the air around you, the oxygen in the air around you, and the way that your body functions is that it creates a negative pressure inside of your chest wall in order to bring air into your chest cavity. And then when you're done breathing at the end of a tidal breath, the air moves out of your body back into the air which we all share. The ventilator cheats a little bit, the same way that we cheat with everything in medicine. The way that the ventilator works is that instead of using negative pressure ventilation, it uses something called positive pressure ventilation. So instead of sucking air into your body or into your chest cavity, it functions the same way that a bellows would. For example, when you're using something like a, a fire, if you're trying to, to create a fire in your, in, your, in your home, it will push air into your chest wall or into your chest cavity and inflate your lungs that way. Unfortunately, like with anything else in medicine, there are always side effects to doing that. So for example, when Dr. Six makes a cut, you will get a scar. And you can see the scar as you're healing from your operation. With a ventilator, there are also consequences. As you're pushing air into your lungs, it can cause other types of problems and other types of trauma to that tissue, which is not used to breathing by that modality. I don't know how much more I should go on about this. <laughs> That's okay. So I guess the question, so you, you talk about how, what you do. And so when our patients are asleep, you keep them comfortable, you keep them asleep but sometimes you have to breathe on their behalf. So if patients are paralyzed, all the muscles are completely relaxed, they're unable to breathe, they're, they're unable to suck the air in, so you have to push the air in with the machine. Uh, so that's, that's for the surgical part. Now, the, the thing is that we're talking about donating this machine to the hospitals in case there's an overwhelming influx of patients and they need to be ventilated. So why would, a, why would an ICU patient need to be ventilated? They're not paralyzed, are they? So it depends on the level of, of um, illness that you get struck with. Specifically with regards to this, to this virus, what we're finding is that a lot of patients require very high ventilatory demands. And what that means is they're needing a lot of help 
to get breathing. And sometimes that involves paralyzing them because when you're paralyzed medically, um, it makes it a lot easier for the vents to inflate your lungs. And so what you end up with is less resistance and fewer of those complications that I was talking about earlier will result uh, from being paralyzed temporarily. Um, we have a lot of experience making sure the patients are taken care of in an ICU setting and, making, and taken care of in the operating room. Um, and so the machines that are utilized today, especially in the ICU, are highly sophisticated. And there are a lot of different things that we can do to adjust the parameters or the settings of that machine to make sure that we optimize the amount of oxygen and the amount of air that you're getting. So the patients that are in ICU, that are, you said they have become paralyzed, and that's, they're paralyzed in order to facilitate the ventilator working better. That's 100% correct, Dr. <laughs> Six. Now, why, why would someone need to be on a ventilator um, that has the COVID machine, uh, COVID virus? So the illness, as far as we can tell, attacks your respiratory uh, system. Um, and what ends up happening is that, as you wouldn't say any other type of respiratory illness, if you have um, pneumonia, for example, the tissue doesn't start to function, the, or sorry, the organ does not start to function uh, optimally. Uh, Think about it the same way as you would as any part of component of your of your car or of your computer as things get older they start to degrade or if you had a virus on your computer things would start to degrade and so you need a little bit more help and so as the virus attacks your lungs you need help expanding your lungs expanding the alveoli which are the smallest functional unit of the lung and also making sure that the large airways the bronchi remain open it also becomes increasingly difficult for oxygen uh, to cross the barrier from your alveoli, again, which is the smallest functional unit of your lung, into your bloodstream, when, and then uh, subsequently from that part into your heart, which is then responsible for redistributing or distributing oxygen to the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to push the oxygen through potentially less, less well-functioning alveoli. Correct. All right. So next what I'd like you to do is if you could help us explain how a ventilator works. So the one we have behind us is very, very basic. This is nothing like what they have in anesthesia, in uh, ICU. They have all more sophisticated machines, but if, um, the, if the system is all wound, then everything will help, and even this old um, cranker is going to be essential. It's going to help keep somebody alive. So how does this, this machine work? What I'm going to do, I'm going to flip the camera. I'll, I'll go a little bit closer, and maybe you can talk about the uh, the setting behind me and explain what how you set these settings and what they do. All right? So hang on a little bit. Let's see if I can turn the camera around. All right, so we're going to turn around, and this is our machine. It's got the oxygen, nitrous oxide, and air. Now, this is for anesthesia only. This wouldn't be used in nitrous, not in ICU, but oxygen and air. And these are the different settings. So can you talk about the settings we have here, and what, what are they for? What is VT, rate, VE, O2? So, um, so basically, when you think about the way that you breathe, um, there's really kind of um, two main components or two very important components to the way that you take every single breath. It's the number of breaths that you're taking per minute, which we call the respiratory rate, um, and then um, the tidal volume, which is the amount of air that you're bringing into your lungs with every single breath. Um, and actually, I don't know if I can flip my camera over here. So this is actually a graph over here of the way that you breathe. and. Um, if you look over here, this tiny little um, uh, this tiny little curve over here would be a tidal volume breath. And we know that for a lot of people, you don't actually always breathe at a tidal volume breath. If, for example, if you're working out or if you're um, engaging in exercise or really exerting yourself a lot, you're going to need to take bigger breaths. And so your lungs are designed for that. And what they can actually do is take a much bigger breath and they can utilize extra parts of the lung. And so what your, what your lungs have is something known as the inspiratory reserve volume. So if I need to, I can respirate or I can ventilate you rather at your tidal volume, which is this small, uh, this small curve over here. Um, or if I feel that you need require more air going into your lungs, then I can increase the amount of air going in by giving you that. Also, it would make sense that if you can take more air into your lungs, that you should be able to expel more air. And so there is also a, a capacity, a reserve capacity in your lungs to expel more air. So we call that the expiratory reserve volume. 
And then finally, at the bottom of the curve over here, you can see this is the residual volume, and that's the amount of air that is always stuck in your lungs. So the settings that Dr. Six is showing you right now, if you look at the top over there, you can see the VT. So that's the tidal volume. That's the amount of oxygen or air, rather, that we provide to you on every single breath. The rate, which is right next to that, which is essentially the number of times that you are breathing per minute. And then um, the, the uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm losing my, my train of thought there. And then if you multiply those, that provides you with the tidal volume. So that gives you the number of breaths that you take multiplied by the volume that you're taking gives you the volume or the number of liters per minute that you breathe every single uh, minute. Um, the air that you're breathing in is made up of a lot of different components, but the two primary components are oxygen and nitrogen. And so the other thing that we have the ability to do is to change the amount of oxygen that you're breathing each with each breath. And so we uh, standard as a standard um, uh, setting, you know, with the air, the oxygen around you is present at about 21%. But during an operation, because your body is being stressed, we can provide you with up to 100% oxygen if we need to. And that we do that by uh, right there, by by alternating those flow regulators at the bottom of the screen. And so for patients that are going to be intubated during the pandemic, because their bodies are dealing with infection, because they're stressed, they will require additional amounts of oxygen. And we have the ability to supply it by alternating or by changing the settings on that machine. Okay. Uh, so this is the machine that sort of you, you change the settings, right? But really what's, what's actually doing the breathing, pushing the air is this right here, right? This kind of goes up and down. Oh, what, what, what is this exactly called? So that's the, that's the baffle, and that's what I was describing before, where you try to use the baffle to make sure that the, sorry, that's a bellows. Um, it's similar to the baffle that, you know, you may have seen if you have a fireplace at home where you try to put oxygen over the, uh, over the wood to create a fire and get that running. And the interesting thing about that is when you set that button at the top that we were looking at before, the tidal volume, uh -huh. if you look back at the bellows, there is a graded cylinder over there. And so whatever you set the volume or whatever you set the tidal volume to, the bellows will drop to that amount. And... Um, provide a corresponding or the correct amounts of oxygen or air with each breath. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to expand up and down. This is really what's pushing the air, kind of goes in now. I assume the ICU machines don't really have this because this is for CO2, or would they, would they have as well, I guess, to filter out the CO2? So and those are the inspiratory and expiratory limbs of the circuit. So the idea is that any time a patient is connected to one of these machines, the, the circuit is closed, and okay. nothing can get or out of that circuit, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to control the total amount of air or oxygen going in. And those are things, those are parameters that we want to keep very tightly controlled. So one of those um, is, is responsible for providing uh, air and oxygen to the patients uh, on every inspiration. And the other one is responsible for moving the air and oxygen out of the patient's body with every expiration. And they connect there um, at the little uh, fantastic mass that's sitting on the top of the machine. Um, as you can see, there's a Y connector that puts them together. The most important thing for the next little while is that little green circuit over there. That's a filter. Um, and that filter is going to be responsible for uh, essentially creating a wall, very different than the wall that's being, that Donald Trump wants to build. Um, <laughs> it's responsible for making sure that bacteria and viruses don't contaminate the circuit and that that circuit can then be reused over and over again from patient to patient and making sure that one patient's bacteria isn't shared with the next patient's bacteria. So are you familiar with the story going around? There's an anesthesiologist that came up with a way to sort of jailbreak the system so you can have more than one per national machine. A multi, I guess multiple tubes. So is this what's going to protect the patients uh, from cross contamination? So the, the idea with that system is that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be using one machine to, multi, to ventilate multiple patients simultaneously. Um, it, was a, um, it was a kind of a, um, uh, a strategy that was devised during the emergency in Las Vegas uh, after the shooting a year or two ago. Um, and it's quite genius, uh, but it's not ideal. The problem is that um, every patient is different. And if you put myself and Dr. Six next to each other, you'll obviously see that you know, we're, we're two very different people and, um, you know, his lifetime of smoking means that his damage <laughs> are not going to respond 
same ventilatory settings that my lungs would respond to. Um, so it's it's in it's basically kind of a last resort, and um, it's it, there's a trade off like with anything else that we do. You know, yeah. we, we talked about the trade off at the beginning where you're ventilating patients artificially, and the price you pay for that is a little bit of damage to your lungs. Um, and the same thing would happen if we had to ventilate three or four patients simultaneously. It's not ideal because everybody needs a different tidal volume and everybody needs a di slightly different pressure, um, not having a ventilator at all. And so until our, our manufacturers can get on board and ramp up production of these ventilators, um, it's something that we can use as a temporary strategy. Yeah. So, yeah. So everybody's got a different tidal volume, different lungs, different re requirements, and if everybody's getting pushed the same amount of air, it's going to be damaging to their lungs. But if that's the only thing you have, then it's better than nothing. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for all the explanation. I hope people that are watching this better understand how ventilators work, how this machine can help. This machine is not an ICU specific machine, but again, uh, it will do the job. It's very rudimentary, but if somebody has no other option, then this can potentially one day save a life. So uh, we've registered this machine with the Ontario Registry, um, and hopefully they'll never need it, but if they do, uh, it's available. Can I just so say one last thing? Please um, do. While we have everyone's attention here, I just wanted to re-emphasize the importance of uh, social distancing. Please make sure that you're taking this very seriously. Um, for the time being, this is really the best strategy that we have to make sure that we can flatten the curve. And as much as you may want to come in uh, close contact with your loved ones uh, and your family members, please make sure it's in their best interest that you maintain social distancing, that you try to go out as little as possible, work from home as little as possible. You're doing not only yourself, but all of your loved ones a favor by uh, emphasizing and maintaining that strategy. Um, and together, we really can make sure that we have a difference in making sure that we, we defeat the virus um, and get through this uh, as best we can. Thank you very much, Dr. Six. Thanks. And that's a very important point. This virus doesn't magically spread from person to person. It comes through contact. If you keep your distance from other people, if you wash your hands, don't touch your face, you will do.